The next thing that I'm going to talk about are business organizations. And there's a lot of different business organization options. You can do a lot of different things depending on what's best for you, what's best for your business. And I'm going to talk about, cover some of them more than others because I think some of them are going to be more important. And you know, some of them are used more often than others. But a business structure is very important. Uh, it's another way of limiting your liability. So we talked about landowner liability and how to limit the danger of people suing you for things that happen on your land. This business structure is another way of limiting your liability. But it's limiting the liability in a slightly different way. It, it, if, if done right, it can stop people from taking property that's outside of the business. So it can protect your home, it can protect your car, it can protect your personal property that's not used for the business. Business organizations are like fire shield, are, are like fire breaks. They're not, they're not a shield. They're not something that can protect everything. But say that you have a, a section of land, a 640 acre section of land, and you have it divided up. You own the entire thing, but you have it divided up. And you have fire breaks put wherever we have, wherever we have the, the lines here. Once you put in a fire break, you can't just leave it be. You have to go back every so often and make sure that it's still cleared and nothing is growing up. And the purpose of a fire break is to stop the fire. If it starts in this section, it's not to protect this section, it's to protect the other three sections, to stop it from getting over there. And the same thing with the business organization. The purpose of a business organization is not necessarily to protect the property that's within the business, but it's to protect everything else that you own. So it's to protect land that you don't use for the business. It's to protect your home and your car and your personal property. And that's the reason a business organization is so important. But in order for this business structure to do what it needs to do, you need to respect the business structure. At the end of the day, the courts are only going to respect it as much as you do. So you can't go out and buy groceries and write a business check for it. You can't go on vacation and pull the money from it from a business account. You have to keep the business books separate from your personal books. Or else the court is, might say, well, you know, they didn't keep things separate. So why should I keep things separate when I'm trying to figure out how much money this person gets, how many assets this person cannot take from you? So, as I said, there's a lot of different forms of business structures. And the first one, and probably the most common one, is a sole proprietorship. And a sole proprietorship doesn't actually provide any protection, any liability protection. Instead, a sole proprietorship, you don't have to, you don't have to, uh, there's 100% liability for the business debt, for the business things that can be taken. So, not only the property that you use in the business can be taken, but your personal assets can be taken as well. You and the business are one. It's not a separate legal entity, so it won't be Joe Smith versus Rumley LLC. It will be Joe Smith versus Elizabeth Rumley. So they will sue you directly if there's a problem. But it's pretty easy to form. You don't have to file any papers. You don't have to do anything else. All you have to do is go out and you start working. But you have to go out and start working by yourself. Otherwise, you're looking at a partnership. But if you go out and you start a business, you're a sole proprietorship. It's taxed on your normal, your Schedule C or your Schedule F. And it's pretty easy to make decisions because you're the only one that matters. You're the only one that makes the decisions for this business. But again, the important thing to remember is that this sort of business doesn't provide any protection, no liability protection at all. A general partnership is very similar to a sole proprietorship, except you have more than one person. It can be a group of two, it can be a group of 30. As long as it's more than one person, with the structure we're gonna talk about, it's considered a general partnership. And it's, 
an association of two or more persons that agree to carry on as co-owners of a business for profit. You don't need any intent to form a general partnership. And it is possible to create one without intending to. And this is where it becomes a problem. Because each partner is jointly and severally liable for the debts of the partnership as a whole. So this means not only if, I, if Becky and I form a partnership, not only am I responsible for my actions, but she's responsible for my actions as well, and vice versa. So if I do something wrong, a creditor or somebody that, that's bringing a lawsuit can not only take all of the property and everything that I own, they could do the same thing for her. So that's why it's very important if you are going into business with somebody and you choose to use this general partnership, that you think about who you're going into business with because of this liability problems. And in fact, even if I lied to Becky and told her I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything bad, she could still be held responsible. There's a case in Arkansas from 2007 where a gentleman was farming with his son and they fought, filed for bankruptcy. They were having some problems making, making ends meet and they filed for bankruptcy. And his son produced a forged personal guarantee that this, uh, on a loan. The father didn't know anything about it. The son had forged it. But the judge said, because they were general partners, that the father was still responsible for it. So it's very important, if a general partnership is the way you go, that you understand the possible consequences and that you go into it with eyes wide open. If you're a married couple, then, are you a general partnership or sole proprietorship? Uh, you're a general partnership as a rule. Okay. There's some, for tax, tax, for tax purposes, it, there, it, there is a couple little quirks on that, but when you're looking at it as a judge would, you're considered to be a general partnership. What's mine is yours, and what's yours could possibly be the person you're suing. <laughs> So a general partnership is a legal entity. So it, it's recognized as a separate legal entity, but it's one that you don't have to take any steps to form. You don't have to, like a sole proprietorship, you don't have to file any paperwork. You don't have to um, write up bylaws or file anything with the state. It can be formed unintentionally. I have an example up here of if you lease any land, go home and look at your land lease. Because a lot of them say, this land lease does not put, does not uh, impute a general partnership to the parties. Does not say that we are becoming a general partnership. Because some courts have and could look at it as, well, the person who's leasing the land, the landlord, and the person, the tenant, they're behaving, they're working together in order to get money for both of them, entering a business for profit, the landlord's getting money, the tenant is running cattle or whatever they're doing, and they're getting money as well. So a lot of land leases will say, we do not want to enter into a general partnership, this is just a lease for land. And that's the reason behind it, because they don't want, the landlord does not want, obviously, to have all of his property to be able to be taken if the tenant does something wrong. With a general partnership, you can have a formal partnership agreement so a document that's written up saying this is who has to do what and this is who gets how much money. There doesn't have to be, but if you want to run it that way, you can, you can write something like that up. Each participant in the general partnership is called a general partner. And typically, both partners have an equal amount of say. Both, of, both partners can make decisions that impact the entire partnership. And typically, profits and losses are split evenly in this general partnership, unless it's decided differently in the partnership agreement. General partnerships are taxed, like sole proprietorships, they're taxed uh, on the individual level. So they're taxed on your Schedule C or your Schedule F. You don't have to file any special tax returns. Because they're called, they're called a pass-through entity, which means that the business is not taxed. Instead, it's just the members or the partners that are taxed. 
Those are the two, general partnership and sole proprietorship, are the two that don't provide any liability protection. What's yours is mine, what's mine is the business's. Everything is possibly, everything could be taken. If something goes wrong, if a catastrophe happens, everything is up for grabs. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about things that offer more protection, more liability assistance. And the first thing is a limited partnership. And a limited partnership actually offers liability protection for at least one party, but not for all of the parties involved. A limited liability partnership has two, two groups of people involved. They have a general partner. There has to be at least one general partner. And a limited partner. There has to be at least one limited partner. And the general partner is just like a sole proprietorship. Anything can be taken, anything can be lost. The limited partner is, can only lose those assets that they've given to the business. The only assets are at risk are the ones that they are using in the business. It's a separate legal entity and it requires some paperwork to be filed with the state. And the name of the business must have the words limited or LLP afterwards. This is just letting people know this is, how you're, this is what your liability status is if you file this business organization. In terms of management, the managing partner, so the general partner, manages the business. That's because the general partner has everything at stake. The general partner is the one that can lose everything. So that you want that person in charge of making the decision. The limited partner is more of a silent partner. They cannot make management decisions or else they risk a court saying, well, you made management decisions, so I think it was more of a general partnership, and now we can take more of the assets. It's also a pass-through entity on the Schedule C and Schedule F. And here's an example of where you might want to use a limited partnership. If you have a grandmother who wants to help her son with a farming op begin a farming operation, the grandmother has the land, and the son wants to farm a limited partnership might be a way that they want to look at, at, at uh, putting the business organization together. In this case, the grandmother would only have the land that she put in the, business, in the partnership. That's the only thing that would be at stake. That's the only thing that that grandmother could lose. She wouldn't lose any other land that was not in the partnership, and she wouldn't lose, couldn't potentially lose her home and her vehicle and her personal assets. Those aren't things that were at stake. The grandson, however, could lose everything because he's the general partner. So if somebody's coming after them, they're coming after everything he owns. This is a big one right here. This is the one most people who are looking at a business organization now, this is the one that they look at. It's called a limited liability company. And it was first invented in the 1970s, so it's a pretty new form of business organization. And it's similar to the limited partnership, only it's not just one person that's protected. It's everybody in the business. So in other words, only the assets that each person puts into the business can be taken. Everything can't be, isn't at risk. And creditors can only reach the property that's been put into the business. An LLC is a separate legal entity. You have to do things in order to make the LLC continue living. You have to first, you have to file paperwork with the state to create the LLC, and then you have to file, file additional paperwork every year. Depending on the state that you're in, you have to file additional paperwork every year in order to keep the LLC status. There's two different options for forming an LLC. It can either be member managed or it can be manager managed. Most of them, quite honestly, are member managed. That's the smaller LLCs, and in the member managed LLCs, everybody has the same stake. Everybody makes decisions and everybody's responsible for these decisions. The manager managed LLCs are more like a farmer co op. That's if, if they're organized as an LLC, it's run by a manager. It's not everybody that's making these decisions. It's one group or one small group. 
And profits and losses are shared equally among the members, unless you decide otherwise at the beginning. In taxation, an LLC can, has a choice. They can either be a pass-through entity, which means that it would be taxed on the Schedule C or the Schedule F, or they can be taxed as a corporation, in which case income that comes in would be taxed at the LLC level, and then it would be taxed as it went out again to the members. And a reason, this is, this is something that happens a lot with larger corporations, and any kind of corporation that's organized is what we're going to talk about later is the Schedule C, uh, C Corp. C Corps are always taxed on the corporation level. And a lot of times the reason for that is if proceeds are going to be reinvested straight into the business, they're going to be, they're not going to go down to the next level, they're not going to be paid out as dividends, then that's where the corporate structure, the corporate taxation is helpful because then it's not taxed at all. Corporations are the most complex business structure. Uh, 30 years ago, schedule, or 30 years ago, S Corps were the way to go. That was the way that most businesses were organized. Now that LLCs have come into the picture, not quite as many of them choose that organization, but it's still a very valid form of organization. With corporations, shareholders are protected from creditors in most case, in most cases. So only the assets that you have put into the business are actually at risk, and not everything that you own. And corporations are a separate entity. They are, as uh, Mitt Romney said, corporations are people too. Because legally they are. Legally a corporation is a separate entity, is separate from its members. You form a corporation just like you form an LLC. You have to file paperwork with the state, and you have to file paperwork with, to begin it, and you have to file different reports every year in order to keep it up. You have to do certain things with the corporation. Engage in formalities, such as having meetings and keeping minutes, and uh, filing paperwork with the state every year. And if you don't keep these formalities up, if you don't keep the corporation up and running, then it's possible that a judge would find that you are again back to the sole proprietorship or general partnership, and all of your assets are, are subject to lawsuit to a lawsuit against you. They're managed typically by a, a larger board, so it's not corporations typically don't have every single person involved in the day-to-day -day management. And as I said, there are two types of corporations. There's what's called an S Corp and a C Corp. And the S Corp is usually where the smaller businesses choose to file, choose to, to engage in. There's a limited number of shareholders, less than 100 people that are allowed to be members of S Corps. But it's not just people that can be members of S Corps. You can also have uh, estates and you can also have trusts that are considered to be members of these S corporations. And there's no tax at the corporate level with an S corp. It's the pass-through taxation, just like you'd have in a sole proprietorship, which just means the Schedule C and the Schedule F. The C corporations, those are the really big businesses. We're not gonna talk about them too much, other than to say that those are the, the national corporations typically have over 100, as many shareholders as you want typically over 100. They issue stock, a lot of times are on the stock exchange. Those are the really big corporations. It's, again, unfortunately, it's one of those it depends. You have to really look at your business and what's best for your business when deciding what kind of business organization to have. But the most important things to remember is in order to meet that goal of limiting your liability, you have to choose a form of business structure that can do that. And sole proprietorship and general partnership do not limit your liability. So options would be the limited partnership, the LLC, or the S Corp. Those are typically the three, the three ways that you can actually meet that goal of limiting liability as much as possible. 
So now I'm going to finish up with transferring the property to the next generation. Estate taxes are something that's in the news a lot. You hear about it, different people talking, and lots of news articles. But for most people, estate, tax, estate taxes are not going to matter, at least for now. One person this year, last year and this year, can pass down a total of $5 million to their heirs. If you have a husband and wife pair, that's $10 million. The problem is, this estate tax law expires at the end of 2012. And we don't know where that's going to go, what the exemption is going to be in the years going forward. But for right now, $10 million is a lot of money. The problem is, when you're talking about agriculture and forestry, is you can be very land rich but cash poor. It doesn't take as much to get up to that $5 million mark as it would in some other businesses, where they have more cash coming in and out and not as much property, not as much land, not as much equipment. Very expensive land, very expensive equipment. And also, with, with simple estate planning, you can pass down a lot more. If your estate is at the $10 million mark, or is even near that $10 million mark, you should be talking to a lawyer, first of all. <laughs> but you can also, there's, there's other things that you can do to pass down more than that uh, unified credit amount. If your estate is over $5 million, the, this is something that is important for this year. And depending on what things look like, depending on what they pass, Congress passes in the coming up years, it might be important later on. But if one of the spouses dies during 2012, they have six months, to, and they have more than a $5 million estate, they have six months to file a paper with the IRS that says, I not only want to claim my, my $5 million, but I need to claim the remainders of my spouse's $5 million to get to that $10 million mark. Unless you're dealing with a really big estate, this is not going to be important. But if you are dealing with a really big estate, this is very important. That's on the federal level. On the state level, a state tax is also not that important, at least in this area. As you can see, Arkansas and Louisiana, no tax. Mississippi, Missouri, and Kentucky, also no state estate tax. So if we're not talking about estate taxes, the next important thing to talk about is succession planning. And succession planning is bringing in the next generation so that they can take on the business. It's passing down the business itself and not just the property that's owned by the business. And how to do this effectively is that's the real problem with estate planning. So if you want to pass down the business, that's something that needs to be planned for. Definitely a lot more in many cases than the actual estate planning. So you need to ask yourself if you just want to transfer the assets, if you just want to transfer the land and the equipment, or if you actually want to transfer the business as a viable entity, something that's going forward into the future. Transferring assets is pretty simple. You have a will, you have a trust and the assets are passed. It's the succession planning where it gets tricky. One of the good ways to do this is to create a business organization. The same kind of business organizations that we were just talking about five minutes ago. And with that business organization, bring in the next generation so you can work together on transferring the ownership and the management of that business. Because if the management isn't transferred, that business is going to die. It's not going to be able to be transferred on if the next generation doesn't know anything about it and how it works. You will need an attorney for this. This is something you just want to talk to somebody about. And because every farm and farm family is so different, so unique, and there's so many different aspects to it, it's something you need some professional advice with. And some questions that you need to think about is, how do you treat family members who don't want to continue running the farm? And what about your surviving spouse? Those are things that you should think about before you go and talk to an attorney. Because it's going to be a lot easier and it's going to be a lot cheaper 
for you to think about and talk about those things at home before you're sitting in the office at $200 an hour and the attorney's asking you those same questions. Another way that people try to um, try to get rid of property is to give it away. There are some dangers to that, however. Somebody who wants to give away large sums of money is subject to the $5 million cap that we talked about a minute ago, $5 million unified credit. The amount of money that they give is then subtracted from the $5 million they can give when they, at the end of their lives. So if you give people a lot of money or property, you might be subject to this federal gift tax, but not unless you're giving away more than $5 million. For example, in 2012, you can give away a maximum of $13,000, which is the annual exclusion, to as many people as you want to without facing any kind of gift tax. But if you exceed the annual exclusion, then you there start subtracting it from the $5 million. That's not very clear, so here's an example. So you have Joe and Sue, and they have a son named Bill. They would like to give him a gift of money or property. The, when does the federal gift tax kick in? Joe and Sue can each give Bill up to $13,000 a year. So right there, it's $26,000 a year that they can transfer. They can also give um, their son's wife or his children. They can also give that amount of money to them as well. So you can see this, this can add up very quickly. So $26,000 to each, of each spouse, $26,000 to the kids. And if you're giving large sums of money, it can add up very, very fast. But what if they have a lot of money? What if they decide to give Bill half a million dollars for three years in a row? They exceeded the annual exclusion by quite a bit, a total of almost a million and a half over the three year span. So that amount of money will be subtracted from the $5 million they can give at the end of the year. Let's put this in a little bit more Arkansas terms. Bobby Petrino gave that, the, the girl $20 million. He exceeded the gift tax. $20,000. 20, I'm sorry, $20,000. He exceeded the gift tax by $7,000. That $7,000 would be subtracted from the amount that he could leave to anyone and probably not the University of Arkansas, would leave to somebody at the end of his life. Unless he wants to claim that his wife was also giving the money, which might be a little bit tricky, <laughs> given the circumstances. <laughs> Again, these are things that you're looking at when you have really big estates. But when you're talking about